I used to get the food from 7-Eleven so that they were going to throw away just because of the date, even though it wasn't bad. They used to tell me no because they didn't want to get sued. But I was persistent and I just kept going back. Please, man, can I get it? I don't want to dig it out the trash, but I will. Do they know that you had this alternate life? They do, and I'll tell them about it. But everybody that I knew at that point always had their own separate agendas. And it was frustrating because then I'm thinking to myself, I'm doing this good. Why is nobody helping me? Why is nobody with me? I remember crying in Griffin Park to my mom I wanted to go. She told me, your job is not done yet. I didn't understand what she meant. And so now this became like my job and kind of were infatuated with it because my natural desire is to help people. Were you a one-man show at this time or did you have help? No, I was a one-man show at this point because then it wasn't an organization. I'm working for this company and I'm in a sense still in their resources. I would literally be driving around the city or I would go down the skid row at three in the morning, passing out food. People used to call me crazy for going out and feeding these people at night. Talk a little bit about your family uh, dynamic. What was your, what was your, what was it like being in the, in your, in your household? Okay. So I was raised by a young mother. My mother had me at 15 years old. So mm -hmm. I am also the oldest of five. So the dynamic of my childhood was really a lot of responsibilities on my side. Some that were, um, you know, given to me by my mother. Others, it, it, as I look back at it, it's really the pressures that I put on myself to be like responsible or to take care of people since I was the oldest. So she had a kid at 15, 16, 18, 19, and 20. So almost back to back to back to back. You know what I mean? So we're, we're all close in age. I'm 35, 34, 32, 30, 31, and 30, you know, so... It was really, um, it was good because we were so young, we didn't know anybody. And we had, like, I had people always to play with, you know, but in all actuality, what was going on around us was a lot of uh, not so good because of like where we lived at, like in the projects in Kansas City or just the struggles that we had because my mother was essentially a kid raising kids. You know what I mean? So it was, that part was, it wasn't, it wasn't bad. Like I said, as, as five years old, cause you don't know any better, mm. you know? And, and speaking of which uh, you said having people to play with, what was your favorite toy or activity as I'll a child? Play basketball. I love to play basketball. Yeah. Basketball was my thing. It's still, you know, it still is my thing right now, but I really, uh, love that for some reason, you know, I just took to basketball and my father at that time, he was still alive, but I don't really remember him being around as much. I know I seen him, but I don't really remember, you know, like every weekend kind of thing, or we were always with him. We were, I was kind of, I always remember being my mother. And so how I took him to basketball, I really don't remember, but I just remember teaching myself like how to dribble the ball between my legs at like four years old. I really have the memory of like, let me lift up my leg. And like, I was trying to do it and recreate what I was seeing on TV or, the, you know, the older kids or, or the adults at the park. So basketball was my thing. What was it about basketball that, that you loved? It, it seemed exciting. It, 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 it really, it really gave me a sense of um, like, and cause I was so young. So it was always older people. So it was that, that yearning or that pool to play, to like be with the older kids since I was the oldest. So I never had anybody to like, everybody that was younger than me, they always needed something from me, you know? <laughs> so to me, it was kind of like a, I guess like an escape you know, to be able to do something else that didn't have anything to really to do with my siblings as much as I love them, but it had nothing to do with them. It was a way where I can kind of get away from them and really do and be kind of my own thing. So to be able to go from being the mentor to being the mentee in yes. a way and yes. find that connection. Yes. And really, because I didn't have it because there wasn't, there wasn't really, you know, my mother is my mother. So, you know, we don't look at her that way. She's, authority figure 
you know, it was really somebody, something, somebody else to kind of learn something from a kind of pull from them when, you know, things or questions that you might have, just regular life questions, not even nothing serious, but just, just, a, just a, a, an escape. Like, honestly, mm -hmm. like, as I'm thinking about it, I never thought about that until right now, but it was more of a, I got to get away from them. Let me, <laughs> let me do something, you know, that had nothing to do with my siblings. But that mentor and mentee thing, that, like, it's going to come into play later. And so right. I'm glad you said it because that's exactly how it felt for me because I, I was the oldest. And, and even then, out of my group of friends, I was like the responsible one in there, the one teaching or the one helping. So I never really had nobody else helping me or saying, hey, let me, let me help you or let me teach you or let me show you. It was like, I got to figure it out. And that's even, that goes to even with me teaching myself how to dribble between my legs. Like my father wasn't there to say, do it this way or do it that way or let me show you. It wasn't that. It was literally, even my mama didn't. I remember it was I, like, I got to figure this out. And was your dad not living with you all? Is no. that what you're imp implying? Yeah, he so was just he your, wasn't. It was just your mom and, and the five kids. Yes, yes. Yeah, he wasn't living with us. I don't, you know, I don't remember where, like, where he lived at. But like I said, I remember seeing him, but just not regular. I don't, I don't, he wasn't, he wasn't there that way. Well, was he the same dad of all your other siblings? No. So just me and my sister that's right underneath me. So it goes me and then two girls and then two boys. Got so it. me and the sister right underneath me, that was her dad as well. The younger three have a different dad. And there was no father figure in the house? No, not in the house. No. But I remember seeing my younger sibling, their dad, more than mine. But that's also because my daddy passed at seven. Their dad, even today, is still alive. You know what I mean? So I could still see him during time. So I don't know if that's jading my view or just because it's been, you know, I had him technically in my life longer. But when I think back at it, yeah, I don't, neither one of them, I know we live with my younger sibling's dad, you know, for a little part during that time because obviously he was with my mother, you know, so, but. When we got about six, seven, eight-ish, no, he wasn't there. As far as living in the house, he wasn't. So I never really recall the time where it was like a man was living in the house with us. You mind if I ask how your dad passed? He had a seizure. He had a seizure. It was um, due to drug and alcohol abuse. So did you know what that meant? When you were a kid, when you're seven years old, drugs and alcohol and how that can affect people, or was that something that you kind of didn't process until later on? No, I didn't really know how it felt. I mean, I didn't know what it meant at all. Um, because by now that time, I remember we were living with, um, like when my father passed, I remember exactly where I was. And they ended up calling the house and told, told me actually, because they asked for me, whoever it was that called. Um, but we were living with my grandma. We, it was, so it was actually my mother's great aunt. So it was like my great, great aunt, but she raised my mother. So my, my mother called her mama and I called her granny, obviously. So um, I didn't know what it meant. I just knew like once I started asking the questions, like, well, what happened or whatever? And it was like he had a seizure, you know, due to drugs and alcohol abuse. Hmm. Do you remember any um, lessons, life lessons that you were told when you were a kid, either by your mother or your great aunt or any of the any of the caregivers that you were surrounded by at that time in terms of, we you know, what to do in life and how to. It was always. No, it was it was. It was really about. Taking taking care of people like my sibling. Cause it was so many of us and it was, I think a lot of that, what I learned is that, cause like even my grandma at the time, like she, she was like a more loving lady. And it was like, she always like had us in for her. She, I'm going to, I'm going to tell you, I was her favorite because she always protected me. Even when I did stupid stuff around the house, she never let me get in trouble. So within that, 
it was, I just learned that from her and like my mother and how she was with us and always like having us together and keeping us together and like doing whatever um, she needed to do. I'm talking about my mother at this point, doing whatever she needed to do to take care of us because eventually my grandma died too, or right around not too long after my father, maybe a year later or something, right? You know me, right around there. I was, I was no older than like eight. So it was always, we were together, we stick together, we figure it out. And then because I was the oldest, so when my mom was, was working or doing whatever she was doing, it was always like, okay, I'm leaving. You need to, you know, watch them. They got to eat. They got to do this. They got to do that. So it was a lot of making sure everybody's okay. My mother provided the foundation, but I got to go. So now you're in charge, you know, make sure, make sure, make sure. Hey, they got their homework to do. Make sure, make sure, make sure. You know what I mean? So it was at the, at the, at the core of it, it was that like making sure the people around you are taken care of. Hey, so a lot of you all have been reaching out with your guest suggestions and look, I appreciate it. I do. And to help make it easier for those guests to say yes to my invitation, I need you to subscribe to this channel. Just hit the subscribe button below, and that's literally the best way to help me get you that guest on my podcast. All right. Thank you so much for helping out and back to the show. You were babysitting when you were, when you were seven. Oh yeah. I was like old. washing, yeah, I was like washing dishes and doing all that. And I, I joke with it. My mom would go, if she hears this, she, she's going to feel a way about this part. But I always tell people, like I used to wash dishes at like six. Mm -hmm. I remember being on the steps through like washing dishes, you know what I mean? Like really, you know and I'm saying taking care of them. Obviously I didn't financially do it, but as far as like physically having to do stuff for them, yes, I remember doing it at six, seven years old. And like my youngest brother, cause he's the baby. He didn't wash dishes until he was like 12, <laughs> you know, 12, 13 years old. <laughs> but it was because he was the youngest and everybody else had to, you know, do. And Nelly just was the, the youngest, but yeah. So, I mean, but that was also like a different time, you know, we talk about 1993 where it wasn't, you know, so bad. Well, maybe it was still bad, but it wasn't so frowned upon for my mother to run to the store and leave us at the house and say, Hey, I'm about to go to the store real quick. Y'all can't go outside. And we knew not to go outside, but at the same time, it was like, I'm in charge while she's at the store or she went or did whatever she did. Mm. And how did, what were the circumstances that led you guys into uh, becoming homeless? The what led to homelessness was when I was about 12, 12, 13 ish. Okay. So let's fill in that gap then. Okay. Let's talk about so your between post. That gap, yeah. So between that gap, um, a lot of what shaped me is because my daddy died, my grandma, that lady I was telling you about, mm -hmm. my daddy's father, my daddy had two brothers, they both got murdered. My mother's actual mother got out of prison. She passed away too. So I never got to meet her. Well, face to face. I know she probably met me when I was like one, but then she went to jail after that. And then she was in jail till I was like eight or nine, got out of jail and passed away. So from seven to like 10 ish, I went to like 10 funerals mm. and like all these people that I guess had an important title in my life was gone, except for my mother, my daddy, his two brothers. So I had no uncles. My mother doesn't know her father. So we can't even count him. Cause I don't know. You could be my brother. I don't know. I mean, or my uncle, I have no idea, you know, so only two uncles that I had, they were not his daddy gone. So that's four males right there gone. It's just in my life and I didn't have no, nothing else. So that part was tough. And then this is an important thing too. So the house that caught on fire, that was my grandma's house. That house, we ended up living there after my grandma passed or whatever. We ended up going back to the house. Cause that was also the same house that my mother was raised in. The, it was a guy that bought the house next door to us, to the left. As a grown man, he was selling drugs. I know that, but as a 11, 12 year old kid, I had no idea what this man was doing. All I knew is he bought the house next door and then he put a deck on it. He added a, you know, sliding glass on the side. 
He put a basketball goal in the back. He used to breed pit bulls. He always looked good. And now he took a liking to me for whatever reason. So me and him obviously got cool because I used to admire him. He used to have the latest Jordan. He always had Jordan's on. He had on a Tommy Hill figure sweatsuit. And like, these are different things that I was never privileged enough to get. I seen my friends have it, but I never got to see this. So one, we bonded over basketball, like I said, because he played basketball. And, and then I would see them playing and I would used to ask him, can I play? Or for a while, it was always, um, you know, you too small, you too little. You can't play with us. We adults. No, you can't play with us. And eventually, because I was taller, then he ended up letting me play with him. Obviously, I wasn't gifted enough to play with him, but he still allowed me to do that. Mm -hmm. and, and, and that helped me because then now I'm playing with adults and grown men at 12 years old. Mm -hmm. But he also gave me um, a puppy. He gave me the money to go buy the, uh, the dog food for the puppy. But when our house caught on fire now, a few months later, I felt away because he ended up getting killed right there in front of his house um, while we were now not in the house because our house is now vacant. And then somebody hid up underneath our porch and waited until they got home because in the Midwest, our porches are a lot higher. We used to go underneath there. They got rocks and crickets and all this other stuff we used to play. So somebody could actually lay underneath there. You and me, grown men, we could lay underneath there if we wanted to. And that's how they ended up killing him, waiting underneath our porch. And we ended up seeing it on the news, recognized clearly that's our house. And now they're, they're filming about this man getting killed next door. That hurt because it was like, now the only, at this point, the father figure that I got now again, yeah, now he stinks. Yeah, no, that's, I want to go back a little bit and talk okay. about, um, a couple things. So, you know, he was into drugs. You didn't know that at the time, but no. you apparently you admired some of the things that he had. What was your idea of success at that age in, in your life? He was. This man had a, a convertible car. He bought the house. Like I said, this house was a, a rundown beater and he had it painted. He did all these home improvements. Oh, I forgot. When I went in his house, he had a fish tank in it in the wall with like sharks. And this is like the like I said, this is the 90s. I just didn't understand because I've never seen nothing like this before. He always had the latest shoes and the latest this and always looked good. I mean, he had different. His friends always looked good, whether they were men or women. He used to have these parties. And I remember looking out the window like, damn, I wish I could go to one of these parties. Never could, but I was just too young. But it was like, if anything, and then like the little stuff that we were talking about, I can't remember it now you know, exactly what it was, but it was always like, it was to help me like succeed in school. Like I said, when he gave me the shoes or when he gave me the sweatsuits or some of the clothes is I know it was because I was saying like, damn, that's nice. I wish I could afford a pair of Jordans. I wish my mama could give me something. And it was like, I got you. No problem. So success. How did your mom time, feel about him giving you stuff? My mom she was cool. She would have known he was a drug dealer, right? Yeah, I'm pretty sure she, I'm pretty sure she knew what it, what it was. But I think at that time, like he was cool too. They were probably around the same age and she would go to the parties. She was over there. <laughs> she was over there, whatever was going on. So she knew, but I don't think she had, I don't think she opposed to it at all. I don't think it was never like that because if you met the man, he was a really nice guy. You know what yeah. I mean? He was a really, he was a really nice guy, regardless of how he got his money. I don't know. And, and I'm pretty sure if my mama needed something, he would look out for her. And now I don't know the intels of their relationship. I hope that not, not going on, but, but he would look out for her. And I know he would just because of, he seen her with all of us kids. And I'm pretty sure he, he did stuff for us. Right. And, and what kind of student were you? What was your work ethic like at that time in your life? Oh, I was, I was a good student. It was, it was all about, um, I, I got, I know I got always got A's and B's. I was always on like honor roll. I never, I'm, I know I was never like this 4.0 student like that, but I was always had good grades. And for me, it was like school came easy. It was very easy to me. 
So it was never really hard. I didn't, I didn't try hard. Did you connect that to, to your idea of success? Like if I get good grades and I'll be able to have things like this guy has things, or did you no, not understand? I never, that... I didn't, no, I didn't correlate the two. I didn't. I didn't. So it why, was just... what was your motivation for doing well in school? To go to college, to play in the NBA? Probably play what? basketball. Yeah, I wanted to go to the NBA, but school and going to play basketball didn't, they didn't correlate to me. I didn't put those together. It was just, school was just, one, I could get away from my siblings. <laughs> it was you always know, about and, getting away from your siblings. Because yeah, even though we all went to the same school, because we were a fifth, fourth, third, second, first. Like it was, just, <laughs> I mean, that's always how it's been. But I had my own group of friends. Mm. You know, we could do that. And like I said, since school was easy, so it was, and I was like really, and I was good at it. So I think part of the success in school, because I was good at it. So I really liked the recognition. Mm. So now let's even take it back a little bit there. Because I was, one, I was darker as far as skin complexion than everybody else. So that was always a sensitive spot for me because I would get teased about it. So then now actually being good in school, I got praised about that. So it was a way to kind of offset and counter the laughing because then I was good because then I was on the honor roll or I was getting a, another little plaque or, you know, piece of paper and, you know, we ain't taking a picture of it, you know, so it was you like. You got those, teased by black people or, or white kids for being I got teased by black kids. Okay. Yeah. Well, I, was, I mean, white kids, I don't think they, they don't get it that way, you know. Right. Um, but the black kids, yeah, for sure. Got it. Yeah. I mean, it's just, it's just a thing in our community, unfortunately. And how how did your house burn down? It was an electrical fire in the wall. The house was old. I mean, the house was old. The house wasn't in no good shape. I'm pretty sure. I mean, as thinking back on it, they didn't keep it in good shape because we live with roaches and rats. I mean, I heard them out in, in the, like at night or stuff like that. So the house wasn't in the greatest shape. So were and you then, guys in the house when it caught We were fire? in the house at that time, yeah. We were actually in the house. And then remember, I, I th- I'm pretty sure my mother, my mother must have called uh, like 911 to help. And then anybody know anything about fire? I mean, the hole might be, you know, small, but then they go over and beyond to make sure there's no extra additional fire in the wall. So that really the house had a huge hole in the back, like in the kitchen. Was it a standalone house or was it connected to, a, it's like a row house? No, it was a standalone house. Okay. Mm-hmm. So what happened once the house burned down? Uh, we where'd, you, up, where'd you guys go? That night we went to the Motel 6. Like the American Red Cross gave us like a voucher or something. We stayed in the Motel 6 for three days. And then from there, we went to a shelter. We went to a shelter. We was in a shelter between the regular shelter and we went to a battered women's shelter. We were there for like four or five months. But that was because it was trying to like, you know, build back up and, you know, my mother get some money and whatever it is she was doing to try to get us like an apartment or something from there. Did she have a job at the time? I do not remember, but I would like to say she did. Okay. I would like to say she did, but she, at that time, she, she didn't, I know she didn't always work like the best jobs. She didn't have right. the, the best jobs, you know? So I'm pretty sure it took her. That's why I probably took her a while just trying to either get some money or find some assistance for us to like help us get a, a, a place. And so now you're the man of the household. Yes. And you're in a shelter. Mm-hmm. How does that make you, what's your mental state in that situation? Still got to make sure we good. Do we keep us together or like my siblings don't, um, you know, veer off because in a shelter it's not, we didn't have our, like our own space. Like it's really one of the shelters, one shelter we did have our kind of own like room, but the other one was really kind of like a wide open space with like beds or cots or bunk beds of some sort. So within that it's other kids there. There's other, you know, people and doing all these different things. And it was just trying to make sure that one, like we kept doing our homework because we still went to school. You know, she still got up, took us to school every day. So it was, it was really trying to, you know, um, like not get in trouble in a sense. Like, let's just stay to, to us. We, like I said, we had enough, enough of us to play with each other. So we didn't necessarily need to go outside of that. And because that shelter, that shelter, it was pretty dirty. 
I remember it's like rat traps and all that. Like I seen, like you wake up and it's like a rat that they, they caught, you know, in the trap. So I, I really didn't want to do too much outside of that. It was really kind of like stay right here together. Was it something you were hiding at school or did you not really care what people thought? Nah, yeah, that, that would have been something I would have hid back then just because I was, as much as people talked about me, I was still a little bit more popular. And I think that that would have hurt to kind of like tell people that like what we were going through at that time. Even though I wish I could have said it, but I don't think my pride, my little pride at 12, 13 would have allowed me to say, we live in a roach rat infested shelter, you know, down the block and we don't have no place to live. Like I wouldn't say that. Were you playing ball for school at this point? Yeah, but during the time when it happened, we were, I was in middle school now. So we literally was like, I went, I went to like a different school, like every year. I went to a different school, sixth grade, seventh grade. Cause then we ended up moving. Cause the house caught on fire in my sixth grade year. And then the next year, you know, we went to a different school and then it was like, we moved again, you know? So I think it was maybe I was in seventh grade. I'm sorry. So we just kept moving, you know, so I wasn't able to play. And then like the schools where it was, we didn't have a, um, like a basketball team in like middle school. Might've had some sports, but because of my home life was, you know, the stability of my home life, then I wouldn't have even felt comfortable doing that at that time. And especially then now, like trying to get any extra fees or, you know, if you needed new shoes and stuff like that, like we wouldn't have been able to do it that way. So yeah, it just, it wouldn't, it wouldn't really wouldn't happen that way. Did your mom know about your basketball ambitions? Was that something she was also? Yeah, she was, towards? she was, yeah, she was, she was well aware of it, but she, at that time, that wouldn't have been her focus. Mm. It wouldn't have, you know, as much as I would have wanted her to push that, and do, you know, obviously what I say, whatever she can, but it was like us being together and having a stable home was her main concern. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would say that for sure. Okay. So then, um, I think at around 12, you moved to mm -hmm. Los Angeles, correct? No, I didn't move here. No, no, no. Uh, we didn't, we didn't come here till I, I moved here as an adult oh, after okay. college. Yeah. The, so that whole time we stayed in Kansas city. Okay. Yeah. So let's move on then to the next, um, you're out of the shelter, you're in a house. Right. And so, what is, what's your, what's your thinking in terms of your life, where it's going to go, what you want to do um, you're now in high school? Cause you now have an idea of what your skill set is, right? you know, right. compared to where it needs to be and all of right. that. So, um, just to rewind a little bit. So, uh, my mama ended up dating, um, this white guy and I'm pointing out that I'm saying this white guy because we were very inner city, like all black kids. And then now for you to introduce this white overall wearing man mm -hmm. to us was different for me. Cause now I'm 13 and it, what happened is we met him because he was working on our house, the house I caught on fire. She met him somehow and he was, and he would come over to make like little repairs. The light was out or we had a little electrical something. He, he would, he would do that. And I ended up starting to work for him at 13 remodeling houses. So I guess over her picking me up, they ended up connecting. So now when we do got our apartment, he ended up moving over there to, to with us. So, but that's also a lot of changes because then now. I'm in a very unfamiliar area as far as where we live. Cause now we moved out of the neighborhood that I knew somewhere, you know, in the suburbs a little bit more. And then now you, you take that now I'm in a different school and now he lives with us as well. So that was all a bit different, but he was asking me as far as the trajectory of my life, but then also because he provided more of the stability then our lives changed a little bit too, because in, in ninth grade, we had, I ended up going to, you know, obviously high school, but it was a school that I never even heard of because now we're out in the suburbs. We never went there. But as far as our life, we ended up getting a house because we was in an apartment before when we got out of the shelter. Now we're in a house. 
We got a swimming pool in the back. It wasn't in the ground. It was a above ground one, but we got a swimming pool. We had our own basketball court. We had almost every animal. We had like four or five dogs at one point. We had fish. My sister had a gerbil and we had a fair, like we had all these different things that his name is Bruce. So Bruce, in a sense, helped provide that on his own business and was able to, to do that. And so uh, life changed in a sense for the better that way. Mm-hmm. Um, as far as home stability that way. So um, at this point, I'm kind of feeling more, you know, once I kind of accepted the fact that he was white, I got over that, you know what I mean? Just being honest. Mm -hmm. Um, I felt like I could finally like breathe and not really be the man of the house (laughs) because here now to do that, I could kind of do my thing. So then at that point, then now, yes, I am playing basketball, you know, in ninth grade. I am on that team. You know, we are, I am in a traveling basketball team, you know, now, you know, my, my brothers is, you know, playing peewee football and they on a traveling basketball team. Even my sister played on Pop Warner football. She played with my brothers, Mm -hmm. you know, so things are better. You know what I mean? Like that's how it, to the, to the naked eye, it kind of feels that way. You know, things are, things are better. And it was like, like I said, I could breathe. So, um. At this point, it was like, yeah, I'm focusing on basketball. And I played football at that point, too. And it was really about me. I worked with him on the weekends or at night. So I still made some money that time. So life ain't as great. Oh, I mean, life ain't that bad. But I will mm-hmm. tell you this, too. So during that 12, 13 is time when the house caught on fire, when we not doing all that great, uh, I went to my cousin. I started selling drugs, too. At that time, I, I know I missed that one, but that's what happened because for me, we needed some money, you know, and my mama didn't know. I, she found that later, but hey, man, it's just, I just could not. I wanted so, I wanted stuff. I wanted mm-hmm. to be able to, to feel normal. I didn't want to, you know, it's a difference between, you know, when you know you poor and, and you just don't know you poor. Like I knew it, felt it. And felt the responsibility and wanted to do something. And and my cousins, that was three, four, five years older than me, provided a way to do that. And I did it. Were you any good at it? Yeah, I never. Yeah, I did. Mm-hmm. I was. And it was, that was during the times where I realized that, um, unfortunately, like, that drug game and the whole world of it is a little different. Then that's when I started to know when you asked me earlier about like when my father abused it, but I didn't do it because then now I was selling it, but I, I told myself I would never actually consume it because I didn't want to end up like that. Cause then for me, I have my siblings and my mother still to take care of. Is that when you also realize your neighbor was a selling drugs and that's how he must've been making his money? Yeah. So then it was all, it was all starting to come over, come around because then when selling drugs, I was meeting so many different people. It wasn't, I wasn't meeting the people that the TV told us the drug dealers look like. Mm-hmm. We were going to the suburbs, to these nice houses with the nice cars and selling drugs. And my cousins would be like, oh, he's a doctor or he's a, or she's a, and then it was like, Jesus Christ, like the same people that's operating on people, they had this problem. And then that's when I was, they, my cousin told me to turn their functional drug addict. I never heard of that before, but in that moment is like, it made complete sense. So then it was like, now I could realize like other things that I'm seeing outside in the world, because this man next door, when I look back at it, he never got up and had a uniform on, you know, he didn't wear a suit and tie. He wore some Jordans, a t-shirt and some shorts. And he was, he did whatever he did. And he was, you know, Providing for the community, but it made more sense then. But were you never afraid that somebody was going to be hiding underneath the porch waiting to shoot you? Mm -mm. Nah, because, not because I wasn't, I wasn't, I wasn't, I wasn't mean about it. We just did what we did and it wasn't no problem. You know, in the, in the time when I had the problem, then that's when I really stopped because then I'm not the person in that business or in that line of work, you got to fully commit to it, mm-hmm. you know? And 
I wasn't willing to fully commit to everything that I would have to do when problems came around. Talk, t- tell me, what does that mean exactly? Can you be specific? So uh, this one guy robbed me for like $20,000, whether cash or product. So, but for the next, so now I'm mad. Obviously, I'm, I can't go talk to my mom about it, you know? And as, at this point, I'm like 16. So I can't go really talk to her about it. But now I'm going to talk to my friends or my cousins. And then now for me, like I was going to murder this guy and his whole family. Because that's the code. You have to yeah, do this yeah, if you're going to yeah, stay in I can't, I can't. Otherwise, like, everybody's going to punk you. Yeah. Everybody, I'm not about to be the guy that you, everybody just going to keep robbing me. That don't, that don't, that don't make the money. That don't make sense. So, um, and I'm not naturally a person that just gets even, I'm going to go over and beyond to let you know, and everybody else know, don't do this to me. You're doing, you're going to do Kaiser Soze on. Yeah. On this we thing. going, we going way over and beyond. And that's why I'm saying like, but then it was like, I had a whole journal of like what time his mother came home, left, his daddy came home, left siblings, like everybody. It was like the perfect execution that I, that I'm planning, like, but I'm still going to school acting like a normal person, but I'm planning to kill everybody. You know, did, did so, you own a gun or guns? Nah, but I could get one. I mean, I had money so I could get whatever I wanted. You know, so, um, yeah. And then, it, and then it was like, it just came to a point where it was like, God, I know this ain't right. You know what I mean? Like, I know this, this, this is not right. Because then now I started thinking like, okay, now I do this to him. Then now he come and kill my mother's brothers and sisters and everybody else. And then now my job is protecting them. Is I didn't do that. So then it was like, I just had to take that loss and keep moving. What made you realize that? Was there something, did you just watch a movie? Do you have a conversation with somebody? Mm to make you realize that? Because you're a 16 year old kid. So you don't, you know, kids can't make a lot of connections like that. What made you be able nah, to make just, that connection? It, it, it's just looking at, it was just literally, I was just looking at my siblings and my mama. And it was, and like I said, I just started thinking like, then like, I did, in a sense of, from a movie standpoint, I didn't want to live my life like on the run. Mm. Because then I would have had to do this and then I would have either and I was going to do it myself, too, because I just had the belief that I don't want nobody to be able to snitch on me. So if nobody, when nobody's there, I didn't tell nobody, then I can't get caught because I'm not going to snitch on myself. But I didn't want anybody to end up finding out that it was me. And then, like I said, then my siblings or whatever else, because they're still little. They don't know. they just kids. My, my sisters and brothers didn't live a life like this. I mean, they might have did stuff when they got older. But at that time, when they 11 and 12, they don't know. They just, you know, live in life. So I just really didn't, I just didn't want to do it. And it never felt natural. Like I knew it was wrong. I knew it was wrong. I knew all the stuff that I did was wrong back then. But I, I didn't care because I needed some money. I like, so you, you know. You paid the 20000 to get out of debt? No, no, no. He's, that's what he stole from me. As far as right. money, how did you? You said you got out of the game. Oh so well, how, yeah. How did you? Yo, oh yeah. You I mean, I, I had some money, and I mean, I end up getting it back. Not as far as that money, but I'm saying I just, I just like cleared whatever, not debts in a sense, but you know, when I just don't go back to, let's say, get more product or whatever mm-hmm. else, then it's just. I mean, I got the phone calls like, "What's up? Where you at?" But it was like, "Man, I'm done with this," and it was just, it was just that easy for me. You know, a lot of movies make it seem like you got to like do a bunch of stuff, but it's not. <laughs> I didn't experience that. I don't know. I don't know anybody that did experience that type of thing. It was just, man, this ain't, this ain't what I want to do. Mm-hmm. So was there a college in your future or what? T- talk about the next yeah, stage. I ended, up, I ended up going to college. So during high school, I was, um, like I told you, I always had naturally good grades. There was something about these tests that they, it was like a, they made us complete this, I guess, this profile page that kind of best identifies like what your interests are, mm-hmm. like an interest profile. And so mine was medicine. For some reason, you know, I guess based off the way I answered the questions, it was about medicine and different things of that nature. Kansas City has a really good medical program. So I end up, I was on the verge of like being a doctor, 
So they, they put me in all these special classes and different things that I would take on like Saturday mornings. And I was taking advanced science and math. So even like my first two years of high school, like I took a ton of math and science classes because I was trying to get it out the way, you know, because then now I'm taking like physics in ninth grade, you know, mm -hmm. and, and I just kept going and going with that. So, and back at that time, that was like my backup plan to be like a doctor, you know, uh, but I wanted to play basketball. You know, so that was that was on the path. And then um, after my sophomore year, my mother and Bruce ended up separating. So now that safety blanket that I had to live my life is gone. So then I stopped playing sports because then my thing was now I got to help her. Mm -hmm. You know, so I didn't continue with sports uh, in high school because of because of that. That's my that's my that's my truth on that. You um, got a job at like Best Buy or something? To, yeah, to I, I worked. Yeah, we was working. Um, I worked at a bunch of nursing homes. Uh, mm -hmm. We was in the kitchen, you know, taking the people and stuff like that. Um, so we we were we were doing a lot of that at that time. And um, like I said, I stopped selling drugs, so that was going too. But I was doing that. A lot of my friends or cousins or something was doing that. I worked at a a moving company. We would do you know move people on the weekends or evenings and stuff like that as well. Mm -hmm. Um. But yeah, so, and then I ended up, um, stopped going to the medical classes and stuff like that too, because now I'm like 17, about to be 18 years old. So then now I was like, well, really, where am I going to go to school? And when I'm literally looking up being a doctor, as far as like how much schooling you have, how much money that's going to take and the loans and everything like that, it was overwhelming because then I knew I wasn't going to be able to pull that much support from like my family circle. And even when I tried to get the loans or try to see if my mother can get do the loan, she couldn't my grandma cause all credits and everything bad, or, you know, I didn't have any extra money. Um, I ended up choosing to go to a computer school in Florida because it was like, well, at this time, this is now early 2000s. It's like, okay, well, computers are taking over, you know, it's still, I still have some interest in that as well. And so I ended up doing that. Then I moved to Orlando, Florida. Was your mom insistent on you becoming, you know, reaching the higher level of education so you didn't end up in a situation like this? Or was this all your, your own uh, sort of self-driven motivation? Yeah, I think she, she encouraged college, but she didn't force college. So, mm -hmm. and I'll say that because then I watched her when my junior year in high school, uh, she ended up getting her GED. And she enrolled into college. So I actually watched her do it. You know what I mean? But it wasn't saying, well, you have to go to college. Like you're going to college. You, you know, like you need to go take the SAT. You need to do this. You need to do that. You need to do that. She never, she never did any of that. It was really like, if I wanted to do it, she supported it. Mm. But it wasn't like, you need to do this. This is what you got to do. Let's prep. Let's do this. Let's do that. It wasn't that. You said that later on in an interview, um, that one of your regrets was you didn't encourage your siblings enough. What did you mean by that? Because I was the the kid in a sense that had always had good grades. I didn't get in trouble. I kind of got to do what I wanted to do as far as being out because I had a car and doing different things like that. And I never, and I didn't drink or I don't smoke. So I wasn't getting in trouble. You know what I mean? Like that. Mm -hmm. And as my siblings grew up and I went to college now, then when I would call back home, because now at this time, you know, I'm 18 years old. So my youngest brother is 13. So he doesn't need me as much anymore. You know, he's in now middle school or whatever, about to be in high school. So, but when I would call back home, their lives and their dynamics to what I knew them to be mm -hmm. drastically changed. My mother moved again to, to the state of Kansas, which is right over the border. So it's not like as far. She moved 10 minutes, 15 minutes away. But now, so now their circle of friends and everybody that they knew changed. But now I don't know these people, you know? And when I would come back home and then now people are dropping out of high school, you know, people are, you know, having babies or whatever else. And it's like, I don't know who y'all are. And I'm saying, saying that because now you dropped out of school or you're not even in high school, you didn't complete it. And instead of me, 
I guess, trying to figure out or being more patient about who they are and figuring out now necessarily how to help them. I just spoke down to them because that's who we was and that's where they were already going. Like, I don't understand how it, in a sense, you, everything changed just because now I went to college. Like I went to college to better my life. Like you were still, you were good. You were, you, you know what I mean? Like we, we had it and it was like, I don't, at that time, I don't know what to say to my brother or sister. Now when I hear you dropped out of high school, like, what do you mean you dropped out of high school? That doesn't, it didn't make sense, you know, right. or, and then now you're dropping out of high school to do what, you know? So I don't, I don't, I didn't know as an 18 year old, you know, how to respond to that other than what the F are you doing? You know what I mean? Like, and that's not necessarily encouraging because then now they might've been going through something too, but then also now I'm not home enough and now we got cell phones. So if I make a call and then now, you know, obviously not a conversation ain't going their way, you know, they feel like they grown now too. So they hang up, hmm. you know, and then now I got to continue my life. So, yeah. Let's, let's say you had to do it over again. What would you do differently? What would you say? differently that you didn't say the first time put yourself back in the 18 year old what knowing what you know now what could you have said i would listen that, more i would listen mm -hmm. i would listen to him talk i would ask him what's going on and listen and not what's going on well i graduated high school or i did this or i did that so you can do it mm -hmm. i think i should have listened to them and what they were going through because i i just thought that because we all grew up in the same house. We got the same mother that it would have been the same. And I didn't, mm -hmm. I didn't realize at the time that regardless if you go, grew up in the same house, we all got different experiences on the same thing. Mm -hmm. And that's what it, that was the biggest thing. Cause I'm thinking at the core of me, I'm no better than you. So if I could do it, you could do it too. If I graduated high school, you can do it too. But I went to the same high school all four years. My siblings moved schools, different friends, different this, different that, you know? So I didn't account for their instability versus my stability. Even when we moved, because I was so vested into the school, uh, the school let me stay, even though I, we moved like out of the district because I was on the sports team and I did this and I was good grades and blah, 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 blah. So the school let me stay. But my sisters ended up having to go to another school. And then a couple of years later, then my brother was now in high school. Now they had to go to a different school. You know what I mean? So it was a lot of instability during that, during that time, as far as like where we're moving and doing different things of that nature. Okay. So now you're, you're in college, you're going through your, you're becoming a young adult, right? You're no longer at home. You're not mm -hmm. technically responsible for your siblings anymore. Right. Um, are you still staying away from the alcohol and all of that? Or are you kind of indulging a little bit? Nope. You know, never, never drank, never smoked ever. What, what, what is that about? Why, why didn't you indulge? It's 100% because of my daddy, because I feel like he didn't care enough about me and my siblings to, to be here for us. He chose, he chose drugs and alcohol over us. Now I know that might not be, you know, technical, but that's how, that's how I view it. Did you look down on people who did drink and do drugs? Or at one point, yes, yeah. At one point, I did because I thought it was a, I thought it was a very selfish act, you know. Mm -hmm. And 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 it, and it, I never. And this is the thing: I never seen anything positive from it, mm -hmm. right? So I never, I never seen the let's say functional addicts, as far as the people that I knew. I always seen the ones that are outside, broke, still in. They look bad. They're not doing nothing with their lives, you know? So that's how I correlated it. And then we were losing, you know, we was going to funerals all the time. So mm -hmm. yeah, I never, I never, I never, I never, I never knew that until I was a little bit older in a sense, how you can still be successful in a sense and maybe have a habit over here on the side. So what was your idea for your life at this point? Now that you're finishing up commuter school. Um, well, my sister ended up getting in trouble, running away to Florida, uh, to be with some guy. And then she ended up moving in with us. So now again, I'm in college 
full time job, <laughs> full time student, and now my sister's here. You know, so end up doing that, and that didn't work out. We had our little issues there, and then um, I moved to California when I was like twenty two. Mm-hmm. So at Why? this point, I just wanted to go, man. Like even going to even going to Florida, like I literally. I did not apply to any school. One, I hate the cold weather. So I didn't apply to any school that where it was cold. If it snowed there or got cold, I'm not going. Mm-hmm. Because we didn't vacation. We didn't travel, you know. And I just knew there was a world bigger than Kansas City. And I wanted to see it. And this was my opportunity. Florida, except I got accepted in Florida. I'm out. I'm going to Florida. You know, and then now I've been in Florida for a couple of years. You know, now it's like, well, I want to go to L.A. Literally, it was that. Like, I want to go to Los Angeles to see what it is. And at the time, you know, I'm young. Uh, I had been working, so I saved some money. Save, I had like $4,000. I didn't even like a lot of money. But, um, but I'm young. I don't have no kids. I don't have no responsibilities. It's just me. And my work ethic is good enough to where I find a job. That's how I looked at it. I find a job. I never had no problem finding a job before. So I find a job, and I just wanted to go and see it. And literally, me and my cousin drove to, to go to L.A., ran out of gas twice, hitchhiked once. We was good. <laughs> it was good. And so what happened when you got to L.A.? I ended up finding a job in a month. I lived out in the valley. Um, most expensive rent that I've ever had. I didn't know places cost this much. When I moved out here, because, you know, I'm from a smaller city where it's rent ain't this bad in Orlando in Florida, the rent ain't that bad. Mm-hmm. And three months later, guess what? Now my brothers are living out here with me. I had some issues in Kansas City. My mom was going through a few things and now I have my brothers again. Not again, but now they're with me. Mm-hmm. Um, I had to enroll them in school. I had to now be be dad again, you know, while I'm trying to work. And, you know, uh, take care of my brothers during this time as well. My mother was having some issues. So Bruce was now by this time, her and Bruce had got back together. And so he was supposed to help me. Um, he was supposed to help out with my brothers coming out here. And uh, he ended up dying. Then come to find out he had a drug problem, too. So here it goes again. Somebody else with a drug problem. And now they're not here doing what they told me they was going to do. Because when I moved to Florida, it was like, oh, you know, I'll help you. I'll, you know, do whatever, you know, try to help out. Cool. And then now I got my brothers literally three months after I moved to, to Los Angeles. No help again. I got to figure it out. So, and from there, it was like we were, I was just, I moved to uh, Vegas for like a year. Because by this time, the girl that I was dating, she had a little daughter and I had my youngest brother still with me. So I was trying to be more of the family guy. You, you, know? have proper, you have proper proper jobs at this time, like, you know, nine to fives and yeah, steady but not, salary. Yeah, but not like the greatest jobs ever. Like the first job that I got when I, when I got here, I was working, uh, I was doing maintenance. I was doing maintenance for this property in Reseda. Mm-hmm. That was the first job. But then by this time when I started, when I moved to Vegas, I was actually working, I was doing maintenance for 24 hour fitness. So I was actually getting paid something kind of decent, okay. you know? So, and that was, now I'm like 24 or something like that, you know? So, um, it was, it wasn't, it wasn't that bad, but like I said, now moving to Vegas, it was cheaper. It was cheaper. And it was like, oh, I can do this. And I was able to get a house and all that other stuff. And like I said, I had to. The uh, the girlfriend with the young daughter and my brother put him in school as well, so it was uh wasn't that bad either. Then we ended up moving back to California. Okay. Back, and how did you get introduced to the population on Skid Row? So fast forward, it was really kind of sitting there with not really doing much for my life because I ended up getting hurt at a job, and so I had a lot of like free time mm-hmm. and really trying to because I was acting and modeling for one point because I didn't have anything else to do. I was on work my time for years, and so after I kind of got out of that it really was a pull on my life to do something different. And like, I felt incomplete. So really it was in those moments trying to figure out what am I going to do? And I used to promote clubs in Hollywood. So 
we end up going out every night and I end up giving a guy like um, like half of my meal. And then, you know, just started thinking like, damn, he wouldn't want half a meal. Like, let me give him his own meal. And that's kind of how the birth of it was, because I would see the same guy outside of uh, Denny's and Roscoe's in Hollywood every night, every night I was him. You know, After we you talk. finished promoting at a club, you would. After we went out, yep, went out to go to Roscoe's, get some food. Mm -hmm. And that was like three, four in the morning. And I would see him and then I would end up talking to him after a while. Gave him the food. And then it was like, hey, man, why are you out here every night? And it just kind of started doing it. But like I said, that pull on my life because we was, was homeless. You know, it was an easier conversation when I would ask my friends like, hey, can you buy another meal? We can give out two meals tonight and nobody would do it. So I just did it by myself. Who and did then, you, when you saw this guy, who did you see? Did you see yourself? Did you see your dad? Did you see somebody you, you know, you came cross paths with? No, I just seen somebody that needed help. Mm -hmm. And, and that correlated with my life because uh, all along here, I feel like my life would have been a little bit better if people helped me. Mm -hmm. I always had to struggle to do different things. And I always wish that like, damn, I wish somebody could help. Somebody could help me. If somebody could help me, I can move. I could move this journey along a lot faster when my car broke down or when this, you know, if somebody was there to help me, if I could call back and say, Hey, can I, can I, can I, can I get $600 to fix my car? You know, that would have been a great help. And so for me, it was like just that compassion to, to help and, and want to help and really listen to him and what he was going through. When your friends refuse to help to even mm -hmm. buy one meal, what, what do you think the psychology of that is? It was a very, it was all about self for them because they were going to do whatever they was going to do. And so, and, and I didn't necessarily like it because my friends at that time were just the only people that I knew when I just first moved to California. So if essentially I was kind of forced to be around them because then I needed, I wanted somebody to be around because I'm used to having all my siblings around, you know, as much as I didn't want them around, but now when I'm gone, it's like, this is boring by myself. And I spent a lot of time by myself moving it, doing different things. And, and so me and those same group of friends back then, we're not even friends today. I know them, but like, they not a part of my journey and what I'm doing today, you know, because we just grew apart because I always knew that that wasn't really what I wanted. That was just where I was forced to be at that moment. Mm -hmm. Okay. So you started buying the guys a couple meals and then what happens? Yeah. So Buying a, buying a guy's couple of meals. And I just kind of kept doing it, not as regular at that time, but I just did it here and there, here and there. And then um, I really kind of created a plan for housing because I was where I was living. That was my biggest bill, you know, my rent. And I wanted to, I wanted to reduce the amount of rent, but I also wanted to provide people housing because then I would see now more people now on the streets. So now I'm, at this point, I'm conscious of homelessness. We always knew it, you know what I mean? But now I'm very conscious of it. Like, damn, there's a lot of people over here. Or me walking around at two in the morning, I didn't see Stan over there. I've seen John over there. I actually now know them by name. And it's like they're sleeping outside when they could be sleeping inside. So, like, I really kind of outlined a vision on how to reduce my rent and eventually one day, like, get housing. And so what I did is I created a plan as far as if I managed the properties, I became a property manager, then I could live there for free. Right. But then also I targeted companies that helped homelessness. So then now I wanted to be a property manager for places that worked with homeless people, because then for me, I didn't know enough people to, to be able to ask the questions. So what I did is I worked there. It was like a paid internship. If I worked there, I worked inside of the mold. Now I can learn. I can ask the questions. I can look at the paperwork. I can see who's coming in and how they were doing it. Because we, this in my life, I've never been, I just don't feel like I've been fortunate enough to know the right people. So it's always been a struggle to get information and in how people's doing it. Especially now I'm living in a big city like Los Angeles. People doing a bunch of stuff out here, but I don't know them. So now let me work there. And that's what I did. I start working at a property management company first. Well, I lied and said I did it in college. 
to get me in the door. And I moved from my one bedroom apartment to a studio apartment, like unbelievably small, but now I'm a property manager. I don't have rent. So now that provided me the flexibility to now go out and now like seek these other companies. So then when I found a larger company that actually did what I wanted to do, I ended up applying there. But now I actually have the skill set that they need because I didn't have it before, but this is a smaller company, so it's fine. But now I'm going to this bigger company. And that's where, you know, it was a very strategic plan of how I went in there and introduced myself and how I got that job. And then from there, it just, I worked for them for like six years learning how they getting the people, where are they getting the people? Like, what does this mean? Like, and meeting the social workers and just kind of really talking to them and going to the de-escalation training. And I literally said yes to everything that they wanted me to do. Because in my plan too, I'm also now figuring out their truth and like what I wanted to do with that. And at that point, I didn't even have a name for the organization as well. But it was literally like, okay, God, this is the speed. This is where I need to be. But not necessarily for working for somebody, but kind of how can I make it better? Because then I also noticed a bunch of flaws within what they were doing. And I also, uh, because now I'm the property manager, I'm depositing like thirty, forty thousand dollars $40,000 every month into somebody else's account. And they don't even treat the people as good as I know that there has to be a better way. Mm. And so that's where like really the birth of it, because when I, did it, I didn't necessarily know it was going to be what it is today. I just knew that the passion for the homelessness because of what we went through before, you know, and also now I'm actually getting to know these people and like now hearing their stories versus just, you know, walking past them like I did all the other years or drop a dollar here and there, you know what I mean? But it was literally that. But then I also remember even when I would drop the dollar, I always had like a little slight conversation with people. Like, hey, what you doing? Don't, you know, and I would really tell them, it was my thing. Hey, man, do something good with it. Because I, I, and I, because in my brain, I'm trying to steer them away from drugs and alcohol because for me, that's probably why they're here. But now for me, I'd have lost everybody due to drugs and alcohol. Mm -hmm. So I didn't want, I didn't want that. So yeah, I want to help you, but it's like, I don't want to feed into your habit, you know? So then that wanting to help you, now with my organization goes even further because now I can give you housing to really move you off the streets and then now work on those other little issues. But like, I got to get you safe first. And that was always my thing. See, because it still goes back to helping people, like getting you safe and making sure you're good as best as my ability, obviously, because now we're adults, you know, but still it was, it was that housing is a, you make sure people are good because we I've been I've been without a house before. Like we had to sleep in the car, you know, a little bit in the snow or be in the house with no heat. Like I get it. So how can I make sure that other people don't have to go through this? So you're in your mid to late twenties at this point. Yeah. Yeah. By this time. Yeah. By this time. Okay. I'm, yeah. So man, I, I know a lot of people in that age, they're just looking to make as much money as possible. Or they're looking to go on as many dates as possible. Right, right, right. And you're sitting around thinking, how can I get all these homeless people off the street and get them safe into houses? Right. right. right? That's what you were yeah. thinking about. Yeah. What was the, was there a motivation be underneath that? Like, were you looking to make that into a business? I wasn't. Not at that time. I wasn't. Yeah. No, I wasn't looking to make it into a business. I was just looking to do it because I had, you know, been trying to do stuff. We, after working all these in jobs, I remember crying in Griffin Park to the mom I wanted to go. And she told me, literally, she said, your job is not done yet. And I didn't understand what she meant. And so like that kind of stuck with me, like my job is not done. And so now this became like my job and kind of, were infatuated with it because of my natural desire is to help people. Like, the, so that personality test when I was in high school about being a doctor, helping people, it's still there. It's mm. still like, that's at the core of who I am. M me being the oldest, as much as I hated being the oldest, 
but like I do get joy taking care and making sure people are good, mm-hmm. even though I hated it, you know, and I used to run away from that responsibility, but like it wouldn't leave me because that's at the core. That's who I am. So. And I sacrificed so, a lot of money and everything else by doing it this route, you know, but. And your mom knew what you were doing. Is that why she said that your job is not done? What was she referring to? She just, she, what she told me is she said, if you came back to Kansas city, you wouldn't be happy. And she said, as much as I want you to be here, obviously close to me, I just know that you wouldn't be happy being here because I like one, she know I don't like the cold weather, but I'm pretty sure she wasn't thinking that, that, but for me, I like the opportunity to be great. And at that time, I probably wasn't able to to articulate it in a way that I may be able to do it now, but I feel like she was wise enough to see that in me. You know, like everybody around here is not doing nothing. You know, like your friends, she might even still see some of my friends and like, they not doing nothing. They, you know, and I, I'm out here now meeting people, whether we're always promoting clubs and I'll tell her like, mom, I've seen Snoop. She really loves Snoop, you know, but even like little stuff like that, because of where we grew up, that doesn't happen for us. So she, clearly seen in it somewhere the excitement or knew something else about me that I didn't know about myself, you know, to say your job is not done. And she wouldn't like, let me come back home, Mm. even though obviously I could, but she wouldn't, she was like, no, you need to stay there and figure it out. And it was like, I guess maybe she didn't want me to quit either. Cause she know that's not who I am, you know? So it was so many different things of like why she might've felt that way. And I know some of it is, how she might feel about her own life or what she didn't do, or maybe when she'd been scared to, to move or, you know, jump outside of her comfort box, you know, and then she don't want that for us. So that's why I love her for that because she, you know, a lot of my motivation what I do right now is because of my mama to, and, and for her support, even though it wasn't financial, even though when I was a kid, I wish she had more money or did whatever else but she always loved us and she never gave up on us. And this was a perfect example. When I wanted to give up on myself, she didn't give up on me. She made me look in the mirror and keep pushing forward. Were you a one man show at this time or did you have help? No, I was a one man show at this point because then it wasn't an organization. It was Mm -hmm. now I'm working for this company, you know, and I'm in a sense still in a resources or how or like, we getting food donations from them and I sidebar to people. Hey man, like I go out at night, you know, can I get some food too? You know? And so I would literally be driving uh, around the city or, you know, the bridges by my house. You know, I, I, I used to get the food from, from a seven 11s, you know, that they were going to throw away. And just because of the date, even though it wasn't bad, but per their rules, they have to throw it away. And I literally, they used to tell me no, cause they didn't want to get sued. But I was persistent and I just kept going back. Please, man, can I get it? Like, can I get it? I don't want to dig it out to trash, you know, but I will, you know. And then it was like once one seven eleven was good, and he was like, oh, call my buddy. I'm going to call him right now. Tell him you're going to go get the food over to that 7-Eleven. And now I had like five or six 7-Elevens that was giving me food all the time. And I would go do that. I would be walking around the promenade, you know, in Santa Monica at three in the morning, passing out food. But then I'm also always talking to these people. You know, I'm talking to them. I'm, I'm, I actually know them by name or, you know, they looking forward to now me coming. And then it was like, oh, well, I know the people at the building that I'm managing, they go to this mental facility. Hey, why don't you go here? Just tell them I sent you. Cause now I know the people too, because now I work at the job. And so that's where it was like, this was great. And then by this time now I did create the name. Literally, I'm a guy that when I see when I hear something or you say something good to me or whatever, I keep it in my notes. And really one day when I wanted a name for now, what I'm doing, like it was in my notes, not in the order, but it was there. And it literally kind of shifted. Like I watched the letters <laughs> kind of form and it was like bare truth. Like it was there, you know? So uh, now by this time, now I got the shirts printed up. And I remember I was in, uh, I was in Culver city passing out some food. One guy and this guy said, Hey, are you a, are you a nonprofit? And I didn't have a clue what this man was even talking about. And I was like, nah, he was like, damn, man, I was going to give you some money, but you can't even give me a write-off. And it hurt because it's like, I'm seeing the humanity of people from a random stranger that I don't know, but now I can't provide him what he needs. 
And that happened to me too many times over the course now, maybe like two years, because now I'm focused on doing the work. I was like, I just got to give these people the food or the clothes or whatever else I, you know, give them. And I didn't really understand the business side and why that was so important. So I was doing the work for years before I turned it into a official business. So this is sounding a lot like a full-time job. Are you working on a part-time job no, to I'm, make no, your I'm ends meet? No, I'm still working at, I'm managing an apartment. I managed an apartment building. So I did that literally by day. And I was like Superman at night or Batman at <laughs> night, you know, because, and then I would be killing myself because I'm up, you know, going around the 7-Eleven, picking up food and then like going to pass it out and trying to find. By yourself in your yeah. car. And every once in a while, maybe the girl I was dating or whatever would come out with me or I could maybe get one of my friends. But for the most part, consistently, it was always me. It's what did like, your no, friends think about this? The, did they know that you had this altern, alternate life? Yeah, they knew. But they do. And they just was like, All right, you know, be careful. You know what <laughs> I mean? Like literally, because then now I'm starting to see stuff, do stuff for whatever, you know, and I'll tell them about it. And it was just like, oh, OK. And like I said, sometimes people will come. But it was like everybody that I knew at that point always had their own separate agendas, you know, doing whatever. So, and it, and it, and it was frustrating because then I'm thinking to myself, you know, I'm doing this good. Why is nobody like helping me? Like, why is nobody with me? Why wouldn't nobody come out? Like, yeah, I know I'm tired in the morning too, but you can come with me. And like, I just wish that people, you know, seen the vision at that time. So let's say somebody's listening to this and they're doing something on their own, their one man show, mm -hmm. and they want to recruit help well is there something now that you've had all this experience looking mm -hmm. back now because mm -hmm. you have volunteers now is there yes. something you could have done or said that could have enrolled people to help you a little bit easier in my experience honestly it wasn't the people that i knew i had to step outside of that bubble mm -hmm. and, and, and it was complete strangers that started coming with me mm -hmm. it, unfortunately it sucks it, it sucks to say that you know but but then i also say for me too. Like my family in Kansas City would have helped. I believe that they would have helped, but I was just in Los Angeles. You know what I mean? So who, so who was, was your first volunteer? My barber. <laughs> you were, He's cutting your hair and you're like, hey my man, barber. I'm going out tonight to 70 Love, but you want to come? My barber gave me $200 and I cry right there because it was like, he actually believes in me. Yep. Mm -hmm. He gave me $200. That was the first, like the first time I mean, people gave me like a dollar or $10 or something, but he gave me $200. That actually yeah. makes sense because your barber's like your therapist, right? He's listening yeah. to your story. Yeah. And I'll be talking time. to him. Yeah. Yeah. He, he really, he, he really supported that. And like I said, it made me, it, it, it was like one of those confirming moments where it was like, okay, I'm doing the right thing. I got him to, you know, I got my barber to give me $200. And mind you, his job is co to collect money from me. Mm. You know what I mean? I pay him for a service. And he gave me two hundred dollars, and he said, "I believe in you." And I was like, "All right, I'm, I'm, I'm good." So yeah. prior to that, you weren't even sure if you were doing what no. you were supposed to do. No, I was just doing what I felt was right, regardless of what people said about me. What, regardless of what you know, why would you want to go out there with those people? You know, it was always something, and it was like, mind you, these are now people that have been now that came to like my my kids' birthday parties at this point, like my, you know, these are close people to me that wouldn't support or wouldn't help out or do nothing, like literally nothing. Maybe they prayed for me, you know what I mean? But that's about it that I know, you know? And that's what I would always say. It made no sense. Like, I don't, mm -hmm. I don't understand it. But then for me, I'm always the, on the flip side of that. You want to do something? Let's go do it. Let's, let's you know, but they didn't, but, and, and I, and I appreciate them for that because in a, it made me work harder to prove to them that this is what I was supposed to be doing, you know? And I still welcome them in today. You know, I have a little conversation with them now, but I welcome them in because we need the, the help and support. And a lot of people told me, hey man, I didn't, I didn't see it. I didn't know what you were doing. I didn't get it or whatever else they told me. And I was like, well, thank you. And, I, and I'm, you know, I'm glad you see it now. So, so you, you had written down in your notes, balance, Balance, ambition, respect, encouragement, um, truth, and then and then later on that became the acronym Bear mm -hmm. Truth. Mm -hmm. Can you just talk a little bit about what those words mean to you? 
So first of all, the B. B is for balance, because I believe, truly believe that you have to be balanced in your life. And I'm talking about even within getting enough sleep. People don't even understand like work life balance or family life balance. Like you have to, you know, be able to give things this appropriate amount of time for it to grow. If you're trying to grow something, you got to put enough water and you got to really remember that if you're standing, if you're if you're off balance, you will fall down. So actually being balanced is actually one of the best things for you. But that's but being balanced is also knowing when to talk and when to shut up, you know, when to go or when to stop. You know, we all have to have that sense of balance in our life. So in the A, ambition. Ambition is just that drive that's within you to do something that you want to do, regardless of what's saying it. Like people used to call me crazy for going out and feeding these people at night. And I'm saying these people because that's what they said to me. These people, they don't care about themselves. Why do you care? But it was really something that I put on my own wall and said, I'm going to get that regardless of what's in the way. So the R is for respect and the respect is really just respecting myself, respecting people. You know, when I go out and I see people in the streets, that doesn't matter that they, they don't smell like me. They don't look like me. They don't have a house like me or drive a car like me, but it's still respecting them as a person and actually understanding their shortcomings while not putting them down or making them feel less than just because I'm handing you a sandwich, you know? So all the time I was out yesterday, they said, thank you, Joseph, God bless you. Or I really appreciate it. And it's like, no problem because it's not no problem to me to, to do this for you. Like I really want to help you, you know, versus taking something from me. And I always tell my volunteers free sandwiches, free water, free this, because I need you to know I don't want nothing from you. This is free. This is from me to you. The E is for encouragement. Like you said earlier, the E, I dedicate that 100% to my siblings because I did not encourage them enough, you know, and I try my hardest right now to make sure that I encourage people on their journeys, whatever journey that is, even if I do not like your journey, even if I don't necessarily respect the journey, but I respect you enough to encourage you through that. Hey, if that's what you want to do, then you go do it. Mm-hmm. I wouldn't do it if you're asking me, you know, if we're, we're in that type of relationship like that where I can say that. But a lot of times I don't say. A lot of times I just look and just say, keep going. And I tell people a lot of times, I tell my students that I work with, keep going. Keep going because at the end of the day, we never know what tomorrow holds. You never know, you know, once you kept pushing forward to do something. Like right now, Years ago, when I was out by myself, I never dreamed that I would be talking to you on, well, on this platform that, you, that we have today. I didn't. All I did is did the work and I kept going regardless of how tough it got, how hard it got, whatever. I just kept going. And that's what I tell people all the time. And truth, I wear truth on the back because I have a truth, you have a truth, and I'm not trying to force my truth on you. And I don't want you to force your truth on me, but I just feel like we can live in a place together and make it better. So regardless of what you believe in, who you are as a person or whatever, that doesn't matter to me. If you need the help and I can help you, I want to help you. You know, when I was a bit younger, that probably wouldn't have been true because my views are also a little bit different coming from where I came from. But now as a grown man, it doesn't matter. My thing is we all need help. And that's what I used to complain about too when I was younger. We needed help. And who was there that's going to help us? And I don't feel like enough people were. So I want to make sure that I do my best to do what people are doing right now. And that's what I'm doing right now with my organization, just trying to do my best. What has been your outlet or your spiritual foundation or any kind of practices that you've kind of turned to to help release stress from all the all the uh, pressure you must have been feeling doing all this and burning the candle at both ends for years at a time? Uh, f- first of all, I believe in God and I'm a Christian. So that's where my faith lies there but i also um i would i would like go home to kansas city to get some type of let's say normalcy for me because i'm very familiar with that familiar with the people you know and just that was kind of like my outlet and i and i and i talk and i talk to, to talk to people and i really do enjoy giving back so if there was a time that i'm feeling someone something i really would say 
let me just go out and, and, and be amongst the people and where we go get some sandwiches, where there was 10 sandwiches or, you know, or 10 burgers or whatever it is. And really uh, do that because at the end of the day, it's a constant reminder for me that life could be way worse than what it is. And probably what I'm complaining about really isn't really that bad. Hey, really quickly, if you like this content or if you don't like it, let me know down in the comments because your likes and comments are going to help me learn what you want more of. And then that way I can keep bringing you the good stuff. All right. Thanks so much for your feedback and back to the show. Okay. So I'm living in, um, you know, some urban area. There's a, there's a homeless area within the urban area. I'm inspired by what I hear. What are some of the, um, what, what are some of the things in the playbook that I would need to know to go and, and help people? For one is compassion. I go down the skid road to let people know that they're not forgotten and that, and that they are loved. Mm -hmm. So for one, we start there. And then from there is really having the conversations with people and really understanding them. I was a victim of my own doings, I would say, because I would go down the skid road or give people food and think that you know, they homeless, they hungry. Of course they hungry. So they gonna eat this sandwich or they gonna eat peanut butter. Or they gonna eat this and why not? You know, but then really not looking at them as people to think that just cause he homeless, that don't mean that he doesn't have a peanut allergy. So those moments realizing that they are people too. So then now when you talk to them, then they'll tell you exactly what they need. Like, that's why I know that fingernail clippers and socks are a really big thing amongst the homeless community mm. because they turn around, and they use their socks to wash their face or to wash up, you know, but now if they had socks and they, now they had hand towels, they could use the hand towel for their body and use the socks on their feet. And a lot of them don't have nail clippers to clip their nails. And then that end up tearing up the socks or tearing up the shoes, you know? So it's all these different, you know, it's di these different things that we don't know, or we don't, we, we don't, we don't pay attention to, you know? So. I would tell everybody to pay attention to that as far as what, what they're doing on that side. Mm -hmm. I, have a friend, I have a friend who um, he's a homeowner mm -hmm. and he's in Los Angeles and mm -hmm. there's a homeless, there's a little tiny little homeless encampment mm -hmm. underneath one of the overpasses in his neighborhood. Right. And he was out one day and he was taking a picture of one of the, tents or whatever they had set up and the, mm -hmm. the guy uh got upset and mm -hmm. started chasing him mm -hmm. and he got he got spooked right mm -hmm. as anybody probably would of course and so then he became really concerned about this homeless encampment and mm -hmm. i said to him i said you know and this is just completely off the cuff i'm like well, why don't instead of like trying to get them removed necessarily i said why don't you go to your neighbors and raise some money and pitch in and try to help these guys i mean right you know, um, and then he said, well, maybe if we do that, then more people will come and, and move in over there. And, 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 and I think a lot of people kind of think like that. I think a lot of people are scared mm -hmm. because they think people are mentally, you know, imbalanced or they'll try mm -hmm. to stab them with a hypodermic needle. What do, yeah. what do we get wrong about homeless people? Maybe the, even the ones in our neighborhood. So some of those fears, I tell people, the fears that you do have are valid, mm -hmm. right? But just like. We all know some bad people. There's also good people, but people are people. So at the end of the day, like I said, once you really talk to them and see, because just because you helped them out, that doesn't mean that people will come because then now if you help them out, then you will maybe probably understand some of their challenges of why that they're there. It could be something political. Maybe you might have a political influence in your community or in your city. And now you can go to the local politicians or when it's time to vote for these different propositions or different things of that nature to bring more money to them or, you know, or to the homeless shelters. You know, a lot of the homeless shelters are really bad. Right. So the people don't want to live in there. They would prefer to live on the street than to live in a homeless shelter. But now let's imagine if we volunteered at our local homeless shelter to clean up the homeless shelter, then now more people might decide to stay inside versus outside. Mm. You know, so it's just a it's, a it's just a way of changing the way we think. If we change the way we think, we would change our life. 
And it really starts with the people because we think that we know what everybody wants and that's false. You don't know what your neighbor wants. The only way that you'll know what anybody wants is if you talk to them. And a lot of times we don't talk to each other. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I had a, I interviewed another woman who does a lot of work on Skid Row and she said, look, everybody, everybody comes out with food on Thanksgiving and Christmas, but what about the day after Christmas? What about right. the month after right. Christmas? Right. So what, what are, if someone wanted to to um, invest time and volunteer? Are mm -hmm. there better days? Are there better times of day to impact the most amount of people? Yeah, I would say for like my organization, we go out every week. We're out there every Sunday. Um, like I said, making sure that people know that they're loved, giving them these different supplies that they can use during the week. You know, so there's always something I tell people, some people have more time than money and some people have more money than time. But we need it all. And we also need the resources and we also need the support. You know what I mean? If you if you understand, you know, if you understand that your car ran out of gas, then it'd be easy just to go put gas in your car. You know, but you got to you guys got to know what the problem is. And most people don't know what the problem is. And I'm saying that's why I will invite you out and you can walk around the streets with me and we can have a whole conversation and you will get to see who these people are what they talking about versus just driving past them and saying, Ugh. you know, mm -hmm. cause a lot of the people are, does have mental, mental illness, but then you think Los Angeles has the largest mental health resources in the country. So it only makes sense that a lot of people with mental illness move here for the support. You know what I mean? So it's that same thing that they, they need it. We need the support. We need people to come out. You know, we need we need the volunteers because for me, I used to be one person having, you know, buying one sandwich or one burger and fries. Guess what? I could only feed one person. But now if we was all able to donate or supply or connect me to your, your buddy that owns the grocery store, you know, connect me to whoever that's making the grants, you know, or connect me to your mom down the street that does whatever. Then now I could feed more of the people. So then now those same challenges or those same worries that we're, we're, you know, we're worried about people, let's say jumping in your backyard. I had a guy tell me, well, these people used to jump over my fence and steal my, steal my items. Well, we had a processes that where I could donate it to them, then they don't have to steal your tent out your backyard. I gave them a tent, you know, I gave them the shoes, you know, and I'm not trying to tell people not to do whatever they want to do with, you know, or donate to any other charity. I'm just saying we go directly from, your garage to the streets. This is what I'm doing right now. You know, or I'm going, I ask everybody to donate a dollar a month, you know, just because those, those add up. Because then now I can, instead of buying five pizzas, now I can buy 10 pizzas. I can feed more people. I can touch more people. And so for the ones that do want to get off the streets, then that's when I do have the housing, you know. So if I can touch more people, we can do more. If you can connect me to more people that's make that's in charge pulling the strings, then I can do more, you know, because at the end of the day, just like your buddy that owns the house, I want those people out of his backyard too. I do. I want them out of there. I would prefer for them to be in their own house. I, I really don't like the fact that people have to sleep on the street. I don't. Or people begging for money or people, you know, stealing or doing whatever they're doing or doing drugs or, you know, needles and whatever else. I really would prefer for people to do that in the comforts of their home. Right now, you, I can't afford it. You have, you've opened up or helped to open up a few transitional houses, yes. right? The yes. Balance I, House, the Ambition House. How did you, how did that come about? Working at that apartment, it was literally that, that, that vision to say like, there's, there's ways or there's opportunities to do it. Was it hard? I literally would tell social workers for two years before I got anything that I had opening because I wanted to establish the connection, you know, and everybody not might, might not agree with the way I did it, you know, but this is just how I had to do it, you know, with what I was faced with. But you have it so that it covers their utilities. It's mm -hmm. furnished. How, how are you, are people so, donating all that? Some people are donating. Actually, there's a lady that was just texting me. She told me she had a couple of new couches uh, that she would like to donate. So some people do donate to different things. Uh, a lot of times I'm partner with uh, mental health facilities or, these homeless shelters where we have a working partnership 
you know, as they get new clients or as I get beds open, you know, we can contact them and we can move them in. And then by that, it's the state is actually, you know, supplying the, the funds for those. So it's not like I just have this major grant where anybody can come. It's person by person. Or some people are working themselves, you know, because uh, what people don't know is that a lot of those people that live in the streets and tents have jobs. They just can't afford, you know, the first, the last, the this, the that. The that. And so that's where uh, we come in and try to provide a, an alternative that might be a little bit more cost efficient, but it kind of covers, you know, everything as well. All right. So if someone is in Los Angeles, mm-hmm. the Los Angeles area, I'm moving out of my apartment. Mm-hmm. I have some stuff I was going to give away to Goodwill or throw mm-hmm. away. Mm-hmm. I want to contact BearTruthInc.org yes. and and see if I can give some of my resources over to you guys to give to homeless people. Yep. That's what happens. That's exactly what else? happens every day. Yeah. Is there anything else that anyone listening to this can do to help or support? I would say, it, yeah, we can go start by, um, you know, going to the website or to the social media page, which is official underscore bear underscore truth. And you can kind of reach out and just ask the questions. I would say, just ask, ask the questions. If you have something on your heart, you can go look on, on the website to see the programs that we have. Some people donate specific things for specific programs and that works. That's perfect because each one of our programs need the additional support. Like I said, I ask people to make the monthly reoccurring donations. You can do that right from the website. There's a donate button. You know, and it could regular, you know, you can automatically do it and you can really see those fruits, you know, kind of come to life with the actions that we do. And if you do want to come out and volunteer, you know, I have a lot of people too. like you said, some people are scared to go outside or go to Skid Row. I have other people that make the sandwiches at home and just drop them off. There we go. Mm. And we still pass them out. So you didn't have to go down there and actually walk around with this. But if you would like to walk around with it, I would love to have you out, you know, even you too, whenever you're back in town. You know, please come out and and we and I could show you firsthand exactly like what we do and, you know, how we do it. And most people that come out, they end up loving it and just, you know, keep keep coming. Yeah, I talked to Jordan Taylor, yeah. who uh, who is how I found you. And, right. and she said that that she thought it was going to be something she did like once or twice. And, then, right. you know, right. Me too. Now she's, I thought she, it was something she was going to do once or twice. And now she's like, I'm coming every week. Yeah. You know? And she started, she started this other thing, mm-hmm. 12 months of, of giving and mm-hmm. she's, she's considering taking right. a much, uh, allowing this to become a much bigger role in her right. life. So I'm right. sure you see that, you see that a lot as well. I, I see it. And I appreciate Jordan and, uh, I love her for, for what she's doing. And like I said, literally, so even with her, she's, you know, they took on my organization that first month. And after, yeah. you know, that last Sunday in January, I was like, okay, Jordan, well, you know, I'll see you later, you know? Whenever, you know, and she was like, oh, no, I'm coming back next week. Yeah. And it was like, even that. So for me, it's like, I know I'm doing something right because I I'm, I had no idea that that's how that was going to happen. And like you said, the, those type of things do happen more. Yeah. I'm always shocked that, you know, people, you know. And she posted about support. it. Otherwise, we wouldn't be having this conversation because I wouldn't even know Correct. what you were doing. Correct. So let me ask you this and uh, to to just wind things down a little bit. How are you, with all of your experiences now working in this, in the nonprofit area, how do you define success these days? I define success how many people I help Mm. as far as when this 65-year-old man thanks me and cries to tell me if I didn't have this house and I didn't allow him to come in that he would have died on the streets. That's where I get my joy from now. The, all the other stuff is good. The accolades or people clapping or people wanting to meet my mom or talk to her or, you know, do, those things are all good. Don't get me wrong. I appreciate them. But when you truly like help somebody and a lot of times when I'm helping people, like I, I'm even suspicious of them. You know, because people tell me a whole bunch of stuff or I'm going to pay you or I'm going to do this or I'm going to do that. And and a lot of times I've been burned by that, but I always knew my heart was in the right place. But when my heart is in the right place, the people do what they say that they're going to do and they actually get a car, get a job, move out, 
And then now I even help them get furniture. A lady, give me a couch. Hey man, I got an extra couch for, you know, when it's, when I see the person come from wherever they was and now they're at a completely different place and, and now actually participating in society, like it's great because it's like, okay, Joe, job well done. Like that's because that's why I wanted to do it. That's why I did it. Now this man is getting his hair cut. He's feeling good about himself. He is actually loving life again. That's what it's about. And I think that's where we as people need to be. Loving life and helping people at the same time. And I actually show people there's a way to do it at the exact same time. It doesn't have to be one or the other. Mm -hmm. You can literally live this complete purpose-filled life and enjoy what you're doing at the same time. You still play ball? Yes, I, I do. I'm a little well, overweight wanna... now. <laughs> the, the, the pandemic ain't been so great and having kids has not been so great uh, as yeah. far as my body fat number. But um, yeah. I still play. Yes, still play. Yeah. And you're a foster parent, which is really cool. Yes. I didn't, I didn't get to take a kid yet, but my house is definitely approved into uh, that was something I want to do. Even with that short story, because if you really research it and the people that are out on Skid Row, Sixty uh, percent of them are probably foster kids because as they age out of the system, they have nowhere to go, and then they mm -hmm. end up down there. So that's I only knew that by talking to them to figure out mm -hmm. where they come from, what's their story, and then that's what made me want to be a foster parent because we weren't foster kids. We never entered that system. I don't really know anybody that was ever really into that system, but talking to them and going out there years after years and talking to people and really finding out their life then it, it just shined on me. And then I started housing them, you know, in my transitional houses. And then I was like, I want to take that step forward and actually have a greater impact because by the time they get to my transitional house, they're already 18 plus, you know, but then I could do it here and make a larger impact on somebody that's a lot younger and kind of catch them before they have to go into my transitional house. Well, I like to wrap these conversations up, uh, looping back around to, what we started talking about, which is uh, your favorite activity, basketball. And, um, you know, basketball obviously is a team sport. Right. <laughs> and as much as you wanted to run away from the team that you were born into, right. it ended up playing a pivotal role in, in really preparing you right. to help to um, encourage the people that, that you, that you, selected as your team, which was this, this community, this homeless community, this foster care community. And, um, you know, I, I think about that, that, uh, I don't know if it was Phil Jackson who said it or whoever, Kobe, I see you have a mama mentality plaque behind you, but oh, yeah. you know, there, there is no, there is no I in team. Right. Right. And to do what you've been doing, you know, it's, it's taken a lot of, of obviously um, motivation, self-motivation, but also just inspiring other people to, to see your vision and to be a part of that vision and to be right. a part of your, of your team. And so I just want to acknowledge you for all the times you had to say yes, because I'm sure even now with everything that you've done, you still probably wake up some days thinking, you know, and I just want to, <laughs> yes. I just want to throw in the towel. This is so yes. much yeah. having to ask people to help me all the time. Yes. And, and, uh, but you keep saying yes, because I think like your mom said, your work is not done mm -hmm. and probably even, I'm sure you probably even think about your dad sometimes when you're out here doing this and you're thinking about how, how proud he would be, you know, in his most sober state to yeah. see you 100%. I think that stepping up the way you're stepping up 100%. and, and really making these people the, the family you never had. Right. So um, so thank you very much, man, for, for sharing your story no and problem. talking about the stuff that maybe you don't talk about as much in this right. interview. No I problem. think it'll inspire a lot of people and uh, hopefully you. we get people reaching out to you to help, uh, to become a volunteer and, and, or to start something similar in their corner of the universe. Yes, sir. So thank you. No problem. Thank you. And obviously we'll put your social media and stuff all in the show notes so that people okay. can find you. Thank and, you. Uh, yeah, man. And uh, and uh, hopefully I'll see you one of these Sundays as well with the mask. I hope on. so. I hope so. Well, hopefully by then we don't have 
if the world is a little bit better where we don't have to be wearing masks. But if you want to wear a mask, I'm fine with that too. I hope I can get All out right, of brother. it. Peace and love, man. Sir. All right. Thank you so much. That was awesome. I enjoyed that. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. If you like that video, you're going to love the next one. Click this thumbnail right here and I'll see you over there.